Welcome to this new Live Your Best Life podcast. And today we have a very special guest, my dearest teacher, Reshri Patel. She's a teacher, speaker, and now also author in the fields of self-awareness, meditation, breathing techniques, happiness and the mind. She has inspired so many people worldwide to experience more happiness in life, to be more self-aware and to live more consciously. And now finally she has written a book, The Power of Vital Force, a practical pathway to the unlimited source of energy and intelligence that is there somewhere out there beyond the thinking and reasoning mind. What is vital force and how can this change your whole life, your lifestyle, your achievements in life and also your happiness? We've met about five years ago and since she started teaching me about the mind, the art of living, healthy food, about what you eat is what you become, my life has really completely changed for the better. I'm also very proud and happy that she will be teaching at our Maximum Potential live event. And today you can listen to the wisdom of this wonderful woman. Here is Reshri Patel. Thank you for being here. Happy to be here, actually. It's always so good to see you, to see you smile. You too, you too. It feels like you're always happy. I, I don't know if I'm always happy, but I certainly know it's the road to wherever I want to go. You know, a smile doesn't cost anything. The moment you smile, the world changes and smiles back. Yeah. You've written a book. <laughs> I have. Yeah, and I'm wondering, first of all, why? And the main question for today is, what's it about? Okay. Why is... Um, so I, I think you know, for the last 35 plus years, I've been traveling around the world, really focused on human potential. How do I support an individual to make their life better? And then as a result, they make maybe their family life better or the community around them better. You know, it has been my focus. One person at a time, we can change the world. That sort of idea. And Anywhere I've gone over the 35 years at the end of a talk or a course, there's a request. Do you have a book? And my answer always was on no, you know, <laughs> squinting at it. <laughs> because <clears throat> the truth is, I don't really like writing. Interestingly enough, I love people. I engage, you know, in real time, exchange energy, emotion, care, connect, so on and so forth. And writing is in a way, quite the opposite. You sit in the corner in your cave and drill down in a sense. And I like to expand out and go vertically down one person at a time. So I had been avoiding it, <clears throat> the writing all this time. But then it came to a point where I had to really say, okay, it's now time. I just need to do this. Partly because 35 years of travel later, I can't reach as many people and make as much of an impact on those who really need it out there. You know, depression, loneliness, isolation, disengagement. It's getting more and more rampant as technology is advancing. We're somehow disconnecting with ourselves, with each other, our own humanity. And so I said, okay, it's time. So last year, February, it was some random moment, I was on a flight to Brazil. I thought, okay, I have 15 hours here from LA. What am I going to do? <laughs> so I opened my computer and started writing. And September 28th, I turned in my manuscript. The book is The Power of Vital Force, published by Hay House here in the United States. It's also there in UK, Australia, and an ebook in India. They have publishing houses in these four countries. So October 1st actually is the launch date. Vital force. Vital and force, yeah. Yeah, I've been thinking about this and the Dutch title would be Levenskracht, which is mm. e equivalent of prana. Uh -huh. I think it, it, it's, it's prana. Mm -hmm. But there's more between those two words, vital yes. force. What is the main message in the book? So I don't think we realize how much 
energy, innate source of energy plays a role in up-leveling everything we do in our life. We think of energy, vital force, life force, or bioenergy, for our body, no doubt, kinetic movement from place A to place B. You exercise, you do all that, you know you need energy, and you produce energy. But for your mind, for your emotions, for your spirit to soar, to feel clear, you know, grounded, centered, calm, and at the same time like you're thriving, You need energy. We haven't ever figured out that our biggest energy drain is our mind. Overthinking, analyzing, doubting, judging, insecure mind takes away our life force. And if we enhance it, we flip the way we perceive out of our eyes, the way our mind functions. So the main single sentence that one could capture all this is, More life force, more vital force, more life, more energy, more you thrive. And it's as simple as that. We do everything, right, to up-level. We read books, maybe we go to therapy, we exercise, we socialize. We do so many things, grooming and looks and feel to improve, not just our body, but our mind and success out there in the world. And Vedanta this ancient tradition of India, boils everything down to two things. Dynamism, shakti or prana, as you said, vital force, and intelligence. We're born with these two things. If we tap into it, if we access it, if we can relate to it, if we can connect to it, if we can invite it in our life, we change everything. Because these are the two things you need for inner and outer success. See? So have we been disconnected to that life force and our intelligence? Yes, perfect yeah. word. How come? We're, uh, lots of different reasons. One is with our eyes and ears open, all our attention is outside, never inside, never really in ourselves. Here and there we do. When something difficult happens, perhaps we pause a moment to say, what's happening with me? But otherwise it's outside. Also technology, this sense of instant gratification, this sense that, okay, I'll be happy if I have all these things. And we know neuroscience has proven it to us a hundred different ways. Happiness leads to success, but success doesn't necessarily make us happy. And so our education system is also that way, focused on reading, writing, and arithmetic, the outer world only. We don't really get trained or educated, not at home, not in school, to look at ourselves, And so we get disconnected from our essence. And our essence is energy and intelligence. This is not just metaphysics, it's science. The body is an electrical system. Our brain, the, the synapses and the neurons, everything is an electrical system. And so we need electricity. And we've never thought about accessing the electricity that we're born with, the intelligence <clears throat> that we're born with. You know, we, we take sugar, coffee, push ourselves through, meaning steroids, hormones, right? If you don't sleep, if you have the adrenal, I got to go, I got to go, then hormones are pushing you to get through. But in the long run, it leads to burnout disconnection, relationships break down, success goes down because we can't function that way for very long. So I I 100% the word you use is perfect. We're disconnected and we're disconnected for all these different reasons. Mm -hmm. We all have to read a book to really understand and to study what you mean, but to to tell a little bit more about what... What's in the book? You speak about peak performance and maximum happiness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is maximum happiness? So it's interesting. Um, Vedanta would say there's four types of happiness. First is where you show up and you get entertained, sense pleasure. So I love soccer. I go to a soccer game. I watch 
and I'm happy. But it's over the minute the soccer game is over. It lasts a few minutes, <clears throat> and then you're sort of back to where you started, right? Second level of happiness is where you engage a little bit. So I don't just watch soccer, I play soccer. That's another level of happiness. It lasts longer. It's not over in the moment, but you go home and you feel there's a sense of team, connection, collaboration, camaraderie, so on and so forth. That's lasting or more lasting. The third level of happiness is you don't just participate, but you coach a soccer team, maybe young kids or whoever, whatever. In it, there's meaning that comes in because you start to contribute to someone else. You get team, you get collaboration, you get joy, you're happy, you participate. All the other things are there, but now there's depth, there's meaningfulness. And actually, human nature wants that. We don't realize it, but we're all in a journey towards discovering fulfillment or inner peace, or you can say meaning in life, right? Purpose, in a sense. That's a third level of happiness. But there is this fourth which uh, neuroscience or positive psychology hasn't yet discovered, and that is your inner state. You, as happiness, without meaning, meaning without having to play, without having to be entertained, or without having to contribute. The best example, Michael, for that is us. When we're born... We're not playing soccer, we're not watching soccer, we're not coaching soccer, we just are joy. We're born that way. It is our innate, essential, essence, core state that we don't realize it just gets covered with life, you know? Something difficult happens, that joy gets covered. Another difficult thing happens, that joy gets covered. Um, it, boyfriend breaks up, business tragedies and losses, health problems, loss of a dear one, <clears throat> all these events cover that fourth state of happiness that we're born with. And the book is saying, whichever happiness you want, you need energy. To go watch soccer, if you're tired, no matter how much your team is winning, scoring goals, you're not going to be happy. You're going to sit there saying, I just want to go home. Oh, this crowd is making me crazy. Oh, it's too hot. The mind's going to be negative. If you are low on energy, you will not play the game fully. You will not participate fully, right? You're there and you kind of go through the motions of things, which is how most people live life. They don't fully participate. They go through the motions, autopilot, we call it. The third one if you're tired and you can't show up to play the game for yourself, there's no way you're going to say, let me make a difference for somebody else by coaching. It all needs energy, including the fourth one, the innate source of happiness, joy, peace, action, if you will, goes down to the degree your life force, vital force is low. And so what the book does is says, number one, how do you drain this energy? It's your mind. It's your emotion. It's your outlook. It's your mindset. It's your perception. And then number two, how do we recharge? How do we boost that energy for whichever level of joy you want? And the simplest way is through breathing, through meditation, through connection, through some self-awareness, through some simple tips and techniques. And that's where the book then ends in this notion of intelligence or consciousness, where you, the innate energy and the innate intelligence come into a state of flow, what we call the zone or the flow where thought, action, idea align, where time dilates and you feel like, I got it, eureka, insight, intuition. So many people worldwide have depression, burnouts, are not happy. You travel around the world. Do you see a difference between Western Europe, United States, South America, Africa, Asia? 
is it all equal? Or can you say there and there are people more happy than in other parts of the world? Uh, I think it's a two-sided answer. <clears throat> On the level of the inner struggle, it's the same. The mind getting stuck in something that happened that we don't know how to free ourselves from or the mind worried about tomorrow and we don't know how to get out of that. It, this piece is the same. But what I find is people who are connected to nature more, who live a life where they there's human exchange in a different way. You know, for instance, if I go to certain parts of South America, if I'm in Peru and I'm in Machu Picchu versus in Lima, there's a very different approach. The connection to nature, to each other, to a sense of family, the stronger that is, the more vibrant they are internally. They may not have a lot outside, you know. Uh, they may not have the big homes and the fancy cars and so on and so forth. But in terms of happiness, fulfillment, joy, I find there's a lot. And there's a direct relationship to self-awareness, to being connected to our own humanity. We can simplify that. And the more you find, like I, I'm in Los Angeles. I live in, you know, West LA, which is sort of, in terms of the world economic situation, California, it's like the fifth in the world. Um, very, very high standard of living. But if you look internally beyond the outside, you find there's a lot of what you're saying, depression, unhappiness, disconnectedness, lots of breakdown in relationships, a lot of internal dis-ease, struggle. And it's because they don't look inward in the same way as the more nature-connected civilizations. And I think if we look back in life, we see that 50 years ago we had less technology, but somehow we had dinner together and we were happier. Now we're hooked into our cell phone 24-7 when we're supposed to sleep, we don't sleep. You see, the sleeping industry, the sleeping pill industry is growing by the minute because what is natural, ability to sleep, get rest at the end of a day has become the most unnatural thing. Most people don't sleep well. Adults, you know. Um, <laughs> if you ask an adult... 10 adults say, how many of you felt like you were thinking all night? Even though seven, eight hours have gone by, you don't feel rested. You woke up feeling more tired. You would be surprised. About seven people raised their hand because they were thinking all night. They couldn't shut this to go off. Can you imagine your computer or your cell phone running 24-7? It would need to be charged as soon as that 10% battery line shows up, you're going to run to plug yourself in. Or you have to shut off your apps to save, conserve battery. We are a hard drive. Our mind is a hard drive. We are constantly on using fuel, battery. How do you recharge? And we have so many apps open, so many files open, thinking about yesterday and a year ago and 10 years ago and what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know how to shut it off. We don't even know that we're running on empty or low battery. And when you see that, you find mental health goes down. You know, naturally, in a sense, everything's connected. Is this what you tell in the book as well? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Because we have so many apps open and yeah. we're not conscious. So maybe we might even don't know what's happening. Correct. How can we close some apps down? <laughs> that is the key question, right? If you, uh, to stick to that same analogy, when your battery is low and you have a lot of apps open, you kind of have the cell phone or the computer has a mental, what I call a breakdown, a glitch in the matrix, meaning everything slows down. The other person doesn't hear you well. The computer slows down. Processing slows down. Effectiveness goes down. Production goes down. We don't quite reach our 
peak performance, excellence, and naturally it's going to affect our state of happiness. So how do we shut the tabs? And that's where the tools and tips and techniques come in. Again, as I said, breathing, meditation. If I can just speak just for a second on breathing, a specific technique, people haven't realized that your breathing is connected to the system that shuts down tabs from sympathetic stress, fear, flight response, which is open files, hundreds and hundreds of open files. That's what stress is, right? Um, I'm thinking about mom. I'm thinking about the boyfriend. I'm thinking about uh, the children. I'm thinking about my job. I'm thinking about the economy. There's so much stress, so many files open, known and to your point, unknown, right? That stress response, that means all the files are open, subconscious and conscious files. How do you move from sympathetic to parasympathetic, which is calm, rest, relaxation response? It's simple. Your breathing is connected to both. Your breathing has the ability to switch off sympathetic, which means shut down the files, the tabs, and move to parasympathetic, where just maybe one file is open. We could call that present moment. When you're working on your computer and only one file is open, you'll see that everything is processed faster. We know this, live in the present, live in the now, the power of now. But cognitively, just talking about it doesn't work. You need an on-off switch, and your breathing is an on-off switch from open tabs to closed tabs, and a singularly focused awareness. That's present moment. That's when we invite all of life towards us, because our vibration, our frequency, our resonance, our hertz goes up. Everything is, is energy. Every energy or everything has a hertz, a frequency to it. Uh, an example would be like wood is inert. It's low frequency, low hertz. When you ignite it, the energy is high, the frequency is high. And more than words, our vibe speaks to us, connects to us, invites life in. Stress vibe is low frequency, anger, regret, frustration, guilt, blame. This is very, very low vibe. And your breathing shuts those tabs off, moves you into the present moment, and present moment is the hurts of a baby. Children have an enormous amount of energy, vital force, life force, intelligence, Happiness, everything we want is there. How do we know that? Just look at any baby. Their vibe, their energy is very high and your breathing moves us there. Look at the breath of a baby. It's very long, very smooth, very easy. You can see the diaphragm and the belly moving. Adults breathe very short breath, very contracted breath. Guess what? That breath is a stress breath. That is the sympathetic breath, not the parasympathetic breath. So one simple tool I could tell a listener, as easy as it sounds and as trite as it sounds, elongate your breath in the day. Consciously, if you add attention and you elongate your breath in the day, you will change, you will up-level your mindset. So I tell people, three times a day, make a decision, I'm going to take a break to breathe. <laughs> really just pause to breathe. No one knows you're doing it. Nobody has to know you're doing it. As you walk out of the elevator and you're walking to your office, nobody knows. Just elongate your in-breath and your out-breath. Do 10. By the time you reach your desk, put on your computer and so on and so forth, you will have moved your mind. You will have closed a couple of the tabs. And then I say second place to do it, just before lunch. You ordered your lunch, you're waiting for it to arrive, or you're sitting in your, your office cafeteria waiting for some friends to join you. Before you eat, 
Make your breath very long and exhale very long, very quickly. Three things happen. You change your digestion because we know uh, this is a huge conversation. I'm, I'm sure you know about it and, and a lot of the listeners. Your gut health is directly tied to mental health. This gut biome, friendly bacteria and so on, impacts not just your physical health, but how you think. It's a huge science around this conversation. And between arriving to the office and lunchtime, your mind is stressing. We're opening lots of files. What are we going to do? With that stress, if you eat, you're changing the pH in your digestion, you're impacting your absorption, and you're impacting the way the friendly bacteria move in your gut. And so I say 10 breaths will close some files, bring you in the present moment. Your breathing is always in the present, so it brings you a little bit more closer. Absorption changes, mind relaxes, and you change your immune response. So just before lunch, 10 long breaths in and out. And the last one is before bed. How we enter sleep determines the quality of sleep. Most of us enter sleep by thinking about should have, would have, could have. Why did I do that? Why did they do that? I don't understand. I don't like my boss. Na, 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 na. That is how we enter sleep. You are keeping your limbic response, your emotional brain on. You're going to process in your sleep. You're going to wake up tired and feeling like you never slept. So I say to them, Enter sleep with the breath. It's life. It's energy. It's a way to say whatever happened in the day, it's done. Tomorrow morning is new possibilities. I enter with my breath. I let go. These three simple things are transforming as tried as they sound. Yeah. It sounds so simple. It is. Breathing yeah. and a short meditation twice a day. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then people tell me, I don't have time for that. What, <laughs> what do you say to those kind of people? I say to them, if you don't have time to breathe, you have no time, period. You have to breathe. It's life. And I'm not telling you to take extra time. Meditation doesn't have to be something you make a big shinding out of, you know, a place to sit and the incense and the bells and oh, cross your legs or any of those things. That's not how my mom meditates. That's not what we were raised with. Meditation is a pause, a moment to pause to say, I matter. That's all it is. It's awareness for a moment from objects and people and things outside to me. Me could be my breath. I'll take a long breath in and out. It could simply mean, oh, my shoulders need to be raised down a little bit. Oh, I'm holding my stomach in. Let me relax it. Just those tiny pauses recharges your system because you know what drains the most amount of energy is all our attention outside getting lost in what's happening out there. The moment you take an incremental step to bring your attention inside to your body, maybe to your breath, maybe to your emotions, maybe to your thought process, maybe just to say, it's okay. I get to start this moment fresh. Just that. That is self-awareness. And it's at that state surge of energy goes up. It's at that state you have meditated. So what I say to people is don't worry about time. Don't worry about the paraphernalia of what meditation is or isn't. In your day, in your activity, just tell yourself, I matter. Let me take a breath and relax. Let me just lower my shoulders. Let me just see that my belly isn't contracted from all this crazy day that I had. Let me just relax it. Let me feel my feet on the ground. Just that simple thing. 
feel your toes in your shoes or take your shoes off and as you get in, just put your feet in the grass. It grounds you. You take in all the positive ions from the earth and you feel really, I matter. The more is demanded of me, the more I have to look at me. Two minutes, three minutes, 30 seconds. That's all that it takes. Tiny habits, big results is what I always say. Tiny habits, big results. I can imagine that a lot of people uh, want to know a little bit more about you, about your life. How does a regular day look like? And I know you <laughs> don't have regular days because every day is different, but uh, w what time do you get up in the morning? So I could share you like yesterday's day, right? I was probably up by quarter to five or so, maybe a little before. <clears throat> I had a nine o'clock session, meaning a lecture. So between then and then, I did some meditation, some breathing, a little stretching. It could be something simple as a neck roll, a shoulder roll, an abdominal roll, as I call it. And then, you know, okay, let me settle down and connect with myself. So I spent some time doing that. I have my breakfast. Eight o'clock, I was on the road to get to my lecture. I had a lecture Maybe about 150 people there, conversation, sharing. After the talk, everybody wants to come up and meet, and they have personal questions. From there, I come back. As I get in the car, I retune with myself. You know, not just, oh, how was the talk? What? No, I reconnect back. Just getting in the car, I'm not doing anything but taking conscious three, four, five breath, feeling the place where I'm sitting. I have lunch. I do some emails, I connect with people, and then I had a three o'clock talk in another city. So I drove, three o'clock lecture, again, maybe about 150 people there, get in the car, met a lot of people, had my dinner, before dinner, a little bit of time to reconnect back with myself, and then I had two more talks, one at six o'clock to six to seven, just one hour, and then the other one, 7.30 to 9.30. Again, a couple hundred people each talk, but I always do a little reconnecting so that in each talk, I take five minutes for them and for myself to reduce, which gives me the energy for the next thing. Mm -hmm. By the time I come home, you know, visit the family I'm with, so on and so forth, and I'm in bed around 11 o'clock. That's more or less a day for me. Mm -hmm. Lots of activity, lots of people, um, beautiful people, you know. What I do make you the eat? most of it. Yeah. What, what, I'm what vegetarian. Do you eat? Yeah. So I'm vegetarian. Um, I do my best to be vegan. It's not always possible. But my breakfast is, so I'm all about um, balancing fiber and color. That's what I say. The plate needs to, because oftentimes vegetarians, their plate looks all white, pasta, bread, uh, you know, some form of dough. So my rule is my plate needs to be colorful. It's a simple thing. So there's fruits and vegetables and, you know, grains that add color and, and vitality to life. People don't realize it, that food gives you more than the nutrition carbohydrates, protein, minerals, etc. That's one side. But food also gives you what I'm talking about, vital force. You get an apple, you get spinach, you get fruits and vegetables, you'll notice they're alive. Vital force means aliveness. After a day or two, they wilt. The life is leaving that particular fruit or vegetable. And so I always incorporate some raw in my food, a little salad. One of the biggest things I'll always add is herbs like basil and cilantro and oregano and so on and so forth because they are super high in vital force. You know, I try to incorporate a juice wherever possible in a day, green juice more than fruit juice because those things add a lot of vibrancy. They up-level your vibe. People don't realize that, you know? If you've, you know curling photography? 
right? You take a picture of something and it shows the vibration at which that is resonating. And fruits and vegetables, anything that's alive generates a very high octane, very high vibrational force. And when we eat it, we absorb that. So that's sort of my basic diet rule, color and vibration in the food, meaning active, not dead food, not canned, not processed, not frozen. Just those two simple rules will change everything for people. Yeah, for me, a really life-shifting event was when you told me whatever you eat you become yes which it sounds so simple but for me it was like an eye-opener <laughs> and since i've been passing through this message i see that people do not really think about what they eat although there is a shift going on worldwide you see more people becoming vegetarian more people becoming vegan But by five or 10, 15 years ago, we just ate whatever. Mm -hmm. And still mm -hmm. I see a lot of people, you know, have the feeling that they eat healthy. But if I see what they eat, it's, you know, it's, it's not even food. Correct. It fills, but it doesn't really, um, or well, doesn't give energy to, to your body. Unfortunately, everything gets driven by economy and finance and, you know, consumerism, right? What sells the most, we run after. What's the fastest, we run after. And in the long run, it's costing you more. So you are what you eat if you really take that idea to another level. We, we spend half our life running after things, speeding up life, wanting to be successful, And we spend our time, effort, energy, and health. Half our life goes into earning wealth, right? What's the sacrifice? Your body, your family, your relationships, your connections. And then you arrive at like 50, 60 years old and you say, oh my God, I have heartbeat, uh, you know, diabetes and heart disease and I can't sleep and I have migraine and sciatica and I'm not walking well and my spine is not well. So now you have to spend the wealth that you gained to try to regain your health. That's not very smart. It, it makes no sense, but the world sets us up for that. The economy, the fast pace, the competition, trying to keep up with the Joneses, you know, not pausing to say, wait, being conscious, wait a minute, what is the cost? And I, I have this um, saying where I say, if success comes with lack of sleep, breakdown in relationship, poor health, um, disconnection with children, then that's not success. That's sacrifice. And we have to make a conscious decision. Do I want to sacrifice life or do I want to live life? They're two different things. So when you're living, when you're vibrant, when you're alive, happy, and you have all that you need, that's success. So unfortunately, uh, to your point, schools don't teach us. Parents don't know. You know, because nobody taught them. And we just kind of like a rat in a maze. We run. And we don't pause. And unfortunately, sooner or later, at a certain age in our life, we will be forced to pause. Mm -hmm. So I'm inviting myself and I remind myself as I speak to anybody else, anyone who comes in front of me to say, Pause for a moment. Three little pauses a day. They don't do anything but give you more life. First thing in the morning, last thing at bed, and somewhere in the middle just to connect back to you, your body, your breath, maybe your belly. Maybe put your feet in water or in grass and say, it's okay. Just that sentence, it's all okay. Today is over. Tomorrow I start fresh and new. If you and me were able to found another education system, a new system for the new generation, what mm -hmm. would it look like? Um, it would probably resemble 
what India once knew. What, what I remember as a very, very young kid, we had what we call two layers of education. The first is matter, you know, education around material sciences, which includes your basic reading, writing, arithmetic, biology, etc. That's one level. That is for success outside. How do I have more home, more cars, more wealth, whatever you want? That's for success outside. But we're more than what we see outside. We are a mind and a body. We are a spirit and a body. There's more to us. We're emotion and intellect. <clears throat> so there would be this second level of education. What I call education of consciousness, spirit, or just how to be happy. That is about the inner world, your mind, your emotions, your thoughts, how we process information, how we perceive. And so that would be an education on values. You know, what do you do with your emotions when you're unhappy? What do you do with your thoughts when they are negative and complaining? That two things together is a whole education. And it's 200% success that makes success. Not just outside, 100% outside, 100% inside, you know. A smile on your face is, is a big wealth, huge wealth. Is there a change going on? 100%. Or are we still blind? No, no, no. I think that we're becoming more and more aware. I think that as the comfort levels through technology are increasing, as you know, Amazon delivers everything we want at the push of a button right in front of us. We open the box, we look, we say, oh, yeah, I don't like it. We put it back in a box, you send it, you see that there's an emptiness that comes. As many boxes as, as arriving to your door, you need more and more. And that alone is triggering a cascade of, of faults to look inward, you know, to say, yeah, Something more is there to me than what I see, touch, and feel. So 100% it's happening. I certainly have to believe that it can happen, and I see it. Otherwise, what would be the point, you know? So it's, it's consciousness, awareness is the journey. I think that the younger generation, the millennials, are, and, and even the newer generation, the X generation, is saying, okay, I want to work. But what happened to life and being alive? And that's making them ask the questions. In a way, um, they're, they're asking the questions, but also in a way getting more disconnected because everything is so instantaneous. The resiliency, the agility that the mind needs to deal with life doesn't have an opportunity to develop. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But we all can start doing it ourselves. Yes. We can start learning every day, breathing every day, meditating every day. You don't need to go to school for that. No, you, can you don't. Come to me, to you, and yeah. of course, read your book. <laughs> yes. It will be published in how many countries already? Um, so right now it's coming out in four countries, October 1st, uh, and translations are underway for... Portugal, Brazil, uh, Argentina, Mexico, Spain, Germany, France, um, and Chinese also translation. Wow. So, yeah, I'm sure it'll take a little while. Those dates are not yet fixed, but they're underway. And, and Dutch, hopefully, also. Yes? I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. What more would you like to tell us about the book? Um. It's certainly not a novel. No. It's not meant to be read through in, in one sitting. It will... There are lots of exercises. Mm -hmm. Like there's an exercise on self-talk, you know? We have it in our head. We're constantly talking to ourselves. What are we talking about? Where is the prominent, dominant conversation? We don't realize it. We don't know how to do that. So there's exercises that make you realize, oh, wow. I'm focused in on this, and this is the energy that's coming, and it's not what I want. Awareness, education, learning about yourself through 
simple exercises is is it's great it's something that will take you inward you know if you give yourself the opportunity to read to digest to do the little exercises not be in a hurry and it ends what i love the most about the book actually is it ends in a place where we say who we are at our core is perfection it guides us to shift the center of our identity we get caught up in roles what i should have what i didn't do right how things didn't work what i failed at right our identity is very far away from the core the essence the way we were born and as you read through the book as you evolve in the book you come to a place uh, that vedanta the ancient wisdom of india says you at your core is perfect just that idea that you take away self blame self deprecation self judgment allows neuroplasticity to change you know allows us to say okay mistakes happen let me move okay i'll do it another way that didn't work i'll try another way so that for me is is a sense of uh, a feeling of fulfillment that perhaps the reader at the end instead of judging instead of finding fault in oneself could say oh who i am i could be as i am you know perfect love and kindness self awareness and gratitude i think is is the best place the book takes the person to yeah. many beautiful words we all going to read the book vital force Thank, Thank you. you so much for being here, Rashri. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.